Well, this is a seminar, it's not a lecture. In this, I, I don't come with any stuff I want to tell you. We just work out through it together and we decide what the presentation is about. Um, we, I, I don't teach philosophy, we do philosophy. We work through issues and we, we find ways to look at our practice and at life through the text we are reading. What that requires is participation. For that reason, if you want to come, I would uh, advise that you keep coming. I mean, what, I, and if you decide, decide that it's not for you and you don't want to come, that's also absolutely fine. But uh, don't make it a kind of sporadic thing, you know, uh, because it's not a sort of, it's not, there is no viewing other. If you are here, you take part. Uh, it doesn't mean that you always have to speak. You can also take part by being quiet. There are different ways. But we work, we work as a group, so, you know, it's a team. That's why um, if you find that interesting, then make an effort to be here uh, every week. Um, and if you don't, then it's also absolutely fine. Okay? Great. Um, that, that, by the way, goes to all of you. But, um, let you already know. All right. So um, now uh, let me just try to pick it up, uh, to pick up where we um, landed um, yesterday. And um, so um, yesterday we, uh, we had a lecture. Um, on this same text by uh, Martin Heidegger, The Age of the World Picture. Just out of curiosity, um, anyone here ha read Heidegger before? What did you read? I read Being in Time. You read Being in Time, okay. How did you find it? I, I used that a lot when I was working on my films. Okay. And all the filmmakers who I were watching at the time were using all of Heidegger's principles of the object. Is that how they get principles? Yeah, how, how that's how, that's how, that's how, that's how it's quite Cartesian. No, but it's how we represent the object and such. That was something... That also sounds quite Cartesian. Okay, but, but fine, fine. Um, Steven, did you say you read... I read the segment about the jug. About? The jug. Oh, the jug. The essay, uh, the thing. Mm -hmm. That's the thing. Uh, we actually, I, uh, we always read it. We read it in this course uh, every year. I think it's, it's, uh, did you like it? Did you find yeah. it useful? Uh, it was interesting, yeah. It's a fantastic essay. Yeah, um, yeah I think it, I was actually considering reading that next, after, uh, after this. Uh, or maybe first we will look at um, something by Jean-Luc Nancy and then go to, uh, to the Jag, because the Jag is a great essay. Um, okay, anyone else read any Heidegger? Yes? I read the just tiny passage about uh, in the uh, introduction to metaphysics. And I remember there was a... Uh, Which one? one well, yeah, yeah. Uh, there's, uh, mm -hmm. He said this thing that uh, moves me about when we study the nothing. So he said, the question is, actually I read it in Chinese, but he meant like whether, the question is why being exists, yes. uh, but not, why, why not, uh, not? Why there is something rather than nothing? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, yeah. yeah. Um, okay. All right, thank you. Can you just push these two tables there together because the crack between them bothers me. Thank you very much. Um, okay, so uh, a few people here read Heidegger. Uh, most of you didn't. So um, no one leaves this course without reading some Heidegger. Uh, so here we are uh, doing just that. Uh, did you all have access to the, um, to the text on Dropbox? Those of you who are here for the first time, if you email me, I will send you a link or the text. Um, actually, I could share it with you right now, so you will have, you have laptops? I don't have laptops. But you can share with someone, yeah? Okay, so just a second, and I will try to um, share with you this book. Um, so, um, email address? Mine is S P L O. A. Sorry, S as in snake. S P L O. S P L O. U F F. U F F. At um, U N I C H dot E U. Like this? Yep. Okay, anyone else has a computer here? Yes? Uh, uh, why? Say it again? Why? Why? Period. Sorry, I, I couldn't hear. Can you come here and just type it? It will be easier because 
we are far, we are too far apart to, to hear. Um, the UAL email. Oh, the, uh, y dot link and then tell me the number. One, 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 two, one, two, zero. One, eight, one. Uh, one, eight, one. This is one, 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 two, zero. One, one, okay, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, one, one, two, zero, one, eight, one, here. Yeah, yeah, Shall yeah, in, one. Well, good. I think it. Okay, it's on its way to you right now. So if you don't have a, the, the reading, you either use the screen or uh, share on the computer. So as, as we start to touch, to touch on this question um, earlier in the seminar, in the lecture yesterday, I just want to give you a little bit of a context of this essay and why we are looking at it. So the question we are investigating and um, been approached from different directions for quite some time, maybe even since the beginning of this year, is what does it mean to make a picture? How one makes a picture? Oh, let's say how one makes an image. What does it mean to make an image, to image something? Um, the reason it is a good question to ask is because the answer seems to be so obvious. It seems like the stupidest thing ever because everyone knows what does it mean to, take, to make a picture. You take a piece of paper, you take a crayon, you draw a house, bam, you have a picture. Or you take a camera, you point it to the tree, bam, you have a picture of a tree. So, so far so good. Um, easy as pie. Right? Well, um, as I was saying yesterday, things immediately get complicated when you try to take this familiar notion. I see a tree, I like the tree, I take a camera, I take a picture of the tree, here is a picture of the tree. So, um, as, um, as a very um, well-known and uh, recently deceased theorist of photography, Alan Secular uh, used to say, anyone heard of Alan Secular? No? Is a, um, uh, he used to say, there is nothing more natural for, than, than for a person to take uh, a piece of paper out of their wallet and say, this is my dog, this is my child, this is my wife and kids, yeah? Um, we, it's, it's so ingrained in our way of thinking that we hardly, uh, we never um, question uh, what is actually taking place. But of course, if you would do that with someone who, let's say, comes from a different culture or uh, from a different environment, they will Says, so what? Are your wife and kids a, a, a rectangular piece of <coughs> card? Might be. You know, uh, in, uh, in the Apollo spacecraft that we sent to, the, uh, to space, there was this particular uh, very famous image. Um, I'll see if I will be able to get it. Uh, no, no, what was it there? Uh, uh, it was, um, it was this, um, how, how would you describe it? Um, It's not really, uh, really not my day-to-day, uh, -day, but uh, wh what? It is this. It is this. Yeah, how is it called? I don't know if it's like a gold disc or something. What's it called? Galileo. Galileo it was, not Apollo? Uh, uh, that's close. Uh, 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 uh. No, many things about watches. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, where? This. Oh, okay, okay, okay. No, 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 it's, it's the man and the woman standing. So it's, it's, uh, it's a sort of uh, disc message 
for hello. Pioneer flag. Oh, flag. Pioneer flag. Pioneer flag. Of course, the pioneer flag. Thank you very much. Ely, hi. Good to see you. Uh, Ely, um, made a piece of metal that was placed on the Pioneer spacecraft and sent it to space on the on the one-way ticket. Um, and somehow someone thought, someone thought that this is a great idea to represent, um, you know, the human uh, civilization. <laughs> it has a little diagram there, how to, how to find us. You see, like the... This is the pioneer, and this is the third drop from the sun. And, um, and um, it is quite interesting, no? you immediately notice that the man is taller than the woman, that the man is actually active and the woman is just standing there. And, but obviously what the, whatever aliens will encounter that, they will think that uh, the human race is made of a kind of wireframe outline. Because it, it so heavily relies on our conventions of representation and how things are drawn how three-dimensional things are drawn in a two-dimensional way. That, um, yeah, anyway, so you get the picture um, that it is pretty astonishing how natural it seems for us to uh, think that a picture is a kind of a replacement or a valid um, clone, if you like, of a real thing. But if we look at this situation a little bit closer, as I said last, uh, yesterday, we can do by um, applying our understanding of Immanuel Kant, the German philosopher Immanuel Kant, to the question of perception and how our reason is structured. Then what we realize is that the picture we take of the tree is not a picture of a tree at all because we don't really know what the tree looks like and not only we don't know what the tree looks like we have no way of knowing what the tree looks like because the what we do know is what image the tree formed or whatever there is let's not call it a tree for now uh, we what we do know is what image was formed on our retina on our um, the lens in the eye, and, and what signal was, uh, electromagnetic signal, was transmitted through the nervous system to the brain, to the frontal cortex, where a certain image was formed. So an image <coughs> was formed in our brain um, by some external stimuli, but we had no way of knowing what stimuli caused this image. Um, I think perhaps perhaps uh, the impressionists were actually onto something Perhaps the Impressionists were actually onto something when they painted like this. Because perhaps what they were saying is that that's what it's really, that's what it really looks like. That is, this is not a painting, this is the real thing. Re reality is like that, is like that. It is hazy, it is made of um, lumps of color, it is unsharp. All this alleged um, sharpness of contour that we perceive, when I look at you, I see all as sharply defined, that has nothing to do with the way things are in real life. This is my um, processing in my brain, giving it a certain, um, apply a certain sharpness filter, like, for instance, the unsharp mask in Photoshop. Yeah? Why do you have an unsharp mask in Photoshop? To define the edges, so you will be able to identify objects separately. Now, it's easy to see why, um, for millions of years, our survival depended on being able to identify things uh, clearly, and we developed the ability to apply an unsharp mask to the tiger and the snake to separate them from the grass. Because if you 
just see some lumps of color moving in the bushes, and the bushes themselves, themselves are, are some more lumps of color. Um, it might be really hard to know when the lion going going to pounce on you. Reality might be, for all we know, reality might be like that, yeah. And then knowing when to start running away is is much harder. But our uh, so our um, evolutionary the, the, the evolutionary develop, the development of the brain perhaps uh, learned to apply a, a unsharp mask. And I think it would be quite interesting project to take these kind of paintings and give them the sharp contours that they, that they lost through this uh, impressionist uh, modeling. Uh, and you know, there is, a, there is clearly a person there in the background, there is another one, but it's really hard to identify them. You need to look for, it takes you a long time to look. This could be seconds wasted because you could be running away this time. Yeah? So, uh, so we learn how to sharpen this kind of image and we get the picture <coughs> that we have, which, you know, all of you are uh, quite clearly distinct from each other, unless, of course, I remove my glasses and uh, then I go back to the blissful stage of uh, seeing you as one big lump. Uh, but um, but it, it is possible. I mean, I'm not saying that that's exactly what happened, but I'm saying that we, it, it could happen. It could be like this. We could really be dealing with a certain form of processing by the brain. And Immanuel Kant says this is exactly what happens. We don't study the world as it is. We study the world as it is perceived by our senses. What the world is actually, there is really no way to know. And it's not that there is no way to know, but here is a caveat with a human brain. Now, I'm saying that there is a caveat because it is possible that what the human brain cannot cognize, artificial brain might be able to. So it is possible that, art that uh, artificial intelligence will be able to prove Kant whether he is right or wrong. Yeah? It is, and um, there is a book uh, by um, Richards, um, um, Richards. Um, let me just go to Amazon quickly and see what is it called. Uh, yeah, there is this book by Ad sorry, Roberts, Adam Roberts, by Adam Roberts, The Thing Itself, which is exactly about it. It is about a computer that works through the, Kant the Kantian principles. Um, and quite interesting if you are um, into, into this Kantian um, Paul Roberts, the thing itself. Um, so, hey, hello, how are you? Hi, Hi Isabel, uh, take a seat. And uh, while you're taking a seat, tell us your name, what course you are from, and um, what are you working on? Um, my name is Isabel, I am from Brazil, and I'm working on joint installation with interactive Good, thank you. Yeah, so, <coughs> so, the point is, the point I'm, I'm trying to come to is that the image, the, the picture of the tree that you get from your camera, in the best case, corresponds to the picture of the tree in your retina. And that really as far as it goes. It doesn't go any further than that. So do not, well, try use it, for instance, in court when you are issued a parking ticket because there is a photographic evidence that you parked on a double yellow, try to argue that this, uh, this, <laughs> this is not a good enough evidence because the, <laughs> the image only exists in the eye of the parking attendant. Uh, that would be a very interesting thing to uh, try. Uh, I guess you could, uh, you could bring a new neuroscientist and a Kantian philosopher to demonstrate that uh, reality is unknown to us and can never be known. Um, 
and, uh, and for that reason, the, the picture only proves what, at best, what the parking attendant saw, but not what actually happened. Um, I would come if you if you're going to <laughs> if you're going to have your day in court, I will come to the <laughs> to the gallery to <laughs> to see. No, you know it is really interesting. Why are we so reliant on the image? Why do we put so much trust in the photograph? And think how much authority the image has because of this trust we put in it. So you have your passport photograph, yeah, and. And anyone who had the unpleasant experience of, let's say, entering the United States with a passport knows the moment when they hold your uh, passport in one hand, look at you sternly, yeah, and determine whether, the, whether you are the person in the picture. Now, the way they do it, people who, people who work as uh, um, border guards, they are trained to identify, I think that 17 points of similarity between the image and the face, so the distance between the eyebrows, the width of the nose, the shape of the lips, and I think you need to hit about 15 of those, and if you hit 15, you go through, if you hit less than 15, then there will be additional checks required. Now, these days, very often it will not be a living, breathing security guard, the security guard will be replaced by an algorithm, you will just be standing there in a little kind of uh, booth, and there will be a camera doing these uh, measurements and comparing them to the photograph, but the principle is the same, it's the, 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 the security guard is also driven by an algorithm, yeah? whether it is a human person or a computer person makes no difference, and it is already a, a automation. So, um, so, in this moment, a decision is being made that is deeply relevant to your existence, to your well-being, to your to your physical safety and this decision is made on a similarity between a photograph and a person yeah so you have to somehow ask why we in why we invest an image with so much power what what is the cause of that what is the root of this situation is that simply how things are or did it was it was it always so was was image always that imbued with that much power why for a photograph specifically has this value of truth that other images don't seem to have because imagine going back to the to the situation with the parking attendant taking a picture of your car parked on a double yellow imagine that on that day the parking attendant forgot her camera at home they see you on the double yellow. They, they reach for the camera, they reach for the holster, the camera is not there. But um, not, not, not being put off by that, they take out uh, their um, pad and they sketch the camera. So they, they draw the double yellow, they, 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 they <coughs> make a picture of the camera there. And then they present that as evidence in court. Here is a drawing. I didn't have the camera, but this is the drawing of the, camera part of the, of the car part there. That would be a different situation, isn't it? It would be easier to refute. You will say, well, he could just make it up. He could just, you know, it was his imagination. So why can't we say that about the camera as well? Why we don't say that about the camera as well? I think we should say it about the camera as well. I think this is one of these tricky questions that once you start asking, you realize then the question is not so much what to photograph. The real question is what photography does. How does it do what it does? How does it create this uh, rhetorical... How does it have this rhetorical force that compels us to believe this image? And believe you me, you will have to pay the fine and the court expenses as well, based on the photograph, but not based on the drawing. So why is that? Anyone have any thoughts about why that is so? Yes, Joe. I was thinking about the fact that I don't think now that we even need this interaction. Need so what? This interaction with right. this cop and this person. Because everything is kind of monitored with cameras. 
Yes. So, and so the purpose of the camera has kind of become just to monitor it. Okay, but, but you're not answering my question. My question was, why is, why is it so? Anyone has any thoughts? Why the photograph is imbued with this rhetorical force, with this controlling power? Because it because it claims that if it is on the in the picture it already it, it's it existed. Like a fingerprint. Yeah. It's like a, it's like a fingerprint, like a trace. Yeah. Um, yes. Maybe also that kind of tradition it grew into, so it replaced uh, painting as a way of depicting uh, reality or yeah. order, and it replaced this. So kind of also replaced the tradition of depicting reality. So I guess even by the very invention of photography and the way it established itself, people just like took it as for granted and as the notion of depiction of reality. Very good, very good, yes. Anyone else? Any thoughts? Any Why is that? Yes. I, um, I think because it takes it from that exact moment and as if you were to draw something, you can continue drawing it or you can draw it at a different time. So you think it's, a, it's about time? It's, it's about, about the, time, yeah. And how do we know that the photograph was taken at this specific time? Okay, is that, is that what you mean? That it has a time stamp? No, I mean, not always. it isn't always. It's not always. Yes, jo uh, Charlie? Um, it's, well, it seems to be impartial as well as if you draw something, I can draw whatever I want in this room, I can yes. draw anything, but I can't manipulate that photo in such a way that the photo is detached yeah. from the photographer in a way that the painting is detached from the yeah, painter. Okay, okay, good. But let's, let's, co let's consider this. Now, I'm, I'm going to just now to simplify things, talk about the digital image, because um, some very interesting things happen also with the analog image, but it might just take us. Uh, I, don't, I want to get to the text, so yeah, believe, believe it or not. Um, but, uh, but I just want, the reason we have this discussion now is just to set the problem. Because as, as I told you on yesterday, Heidegger is a great philosopher, uh, a dangerous philosopher as well, because as, says, as I said, he was a Nazi, um, as well as, uh, as a great thinker. Um, and, um, but what makes him so interesting and relevant for people who are interested in art is that instead of providing answers, as most philosophers did before him, he offers a very interesting question. <coughs> and this, one, this is one of his interesting questions, slightly adapted to the discussion about the image, about the photograph. Um, but that's basically the question he asks in the age of the world picture. Why we believe the picture so much? Why we believe the photograph so much? John, you, you want to say something? I was thinking that what are you answering? The, the question which you just asked before uh -huh. about is it that the images have become part of our life now? Why? Because we use images for almost everything. We take images of cats, and whatever we see. Yeah. So it's almost like but what about, what about the photograph that makes it more truthful than a painting? Because the painting has kind of lost its relevance. It is not. Everybody is going to show a painting of themselves now. They would rather show a photograph of themselves. Okay, Ryan. Uh, because it mimics the function and perception of our eyes. Okay, and, and, and uh, drawing doesn't? Painting doesn't? It doesn't have to. So do you think we... we the, the photograph mimics what we see? Yeah, that's what you're saying. Okay. Yeah, okay. Yes. Uh, like yes. But more, and then we move on. Yes. Well, if you think about it in cancer terms, then that's not really valid. This, it could be. What is not valid? Sorry. Uh, like if you think about it in Kantian terms. Yeah. Um, in Kantian terms. Yeah. Okay. Give it to us. And saying like, yeah. uh, what, what we perceive with our eyes is the reality doesn't really work because it can be just something that is, you know, it's just rendered in our in our head. So yeah, but that, I'm agreeing with that. That's why I think. Okay. Yeah. Like, yeah. Yeah. That's why I'm saying we believe. Yeah, 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 yeah. I understand. I understand. Did, did you want to contribute from here, from this? Uh, I was thinking about because my my first question was in, because nothing else can do what image does to 100% copy a reality. If something else can do more than image, we're gonna believe that that thing. But. 
Oh, yeah, 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 but I think it's interesting what you say. But isn't it also the case that reality looks nothing like images? So, what is going on here? It looks like we are giving some way of, some, some form of framing, excessive political power. Now, I don't want to get too much into sort of uh, um, a, a kind of politics with this because the time will, there will be time for that. But uh, the whole kind of con uh, current worry about truth and post-truth very much boils down to the question of the photograph. Uh, and we will get to that um, in an oblique way, uh, perhaps in this session or the next. But um, just, just, go, just to sharpen it a bit, with the digital image, because some people say, were saying here, well, the image is a, it kind of captures exactly what was going on. So first we saw that is not the case, because we don't know what was going on. We only know what our eye perceived and what our brain um, processed using the sharp mask, the Gaussian blur, and whatever other tools, uh, the kind of our internal Photoshop has at its, uh, at its disposal. But um, let's say we do have a, a digital, uh, we do have a camera with a CCCD, with a, um, with a uh, sensitive, light sensitive cell, we have a memory card, we point it at something, we take a picture, yeah? So we get, so some kind of um, data entered the camera and the, in its original state, all the cells in the CCD were zero. Question? Um, I was going to try again. Okay. Um, I think it's because photography replaced painting in our idea of representing reality. Okay, good. It's absolutely right. Yes, yes. And now we need to unpack what the representation means. Absolutely right. Good. Okay. So we yes. Uh, also, like you were saying, the impressionists had this kind of lazy kind of way of looking at everything. Yeah. So maybe photography is the new haze, in a sense. The new haze. Okay, that, that's that's nice, uh, but it's uh, it doesn't help us here. So thank you. Um, okay, so we have this um, um, uh, silicon cell in the camera. All the values are at zero. Yeah. Then the shutter opens for a while. Light enters. Light is is charged particles. They change the value of some of the, cell, of the uh, cells inside the um, this, uh, light sensitive surface to ones, yeah? So then instead of having 0, 0, 0, 0, we have 0, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1. So we have all this kind of array of ones and zeros. Okay, so that is how the data from the outside world entered the camera and became information, yeah? That's, the, that's what humans know, learned how to do, how to convert data to information. Data from Latin datum, to give, is that which is given. Information is how this given becomes uh, given a form, information. Okay, so you have this information on your light sensitive um, device and you could, if you wanted, you could just read it as a string of ones and zeros uh, and just leave it at that. You could just print it out as a string of ones and zeros. You could also use, uh, that's basically what we call in photography the raw file. R-A-W, the raw file. Um, it, it's, a, it's, it's the file of, light, uh, of the data that um, um, stored on the, on the uh, light sensitive device and it was not manipulated in any way. Okay? Now, what normally happens, what usually happens, is that this, this raw information is now being processed by an algorithm. Yeah? The algorithm in the camera is written by some clever boys and girls uh, to output this information in something that looks like a photograph. Okay. But you understand that this algorithm that was written by these clever boys and girls it really has nothing to do with the bird or the tree or anything like that. It was just written by some people. It's basically a piece of text. It's a form of poetry, if you like. Code is text. Code is writing, yeah? So this information was poetically transposed into something else. Now, you could also imagine a different algorithm inside your camera that outputs this 
information not as a picture but as a song. It could just as easily take these ones and zeros and convert them to musical notations. Yeah, uh, zero will be the note uh, B minus, B flat, and uh, one will be uh, A, and you will have a song coming out based on the same information. Yeah, or you could output it as letters. Yeah, let all zeros be uh, the letter F, and let all ones be the letter K, and you can output this as, as a text, and you can just read it. Yeah, I'm not saying it will be riveting read, but you could just could make it into a text. Yeah, but in that case, you, you get it as a picture. But you understand that the picture is an arbitrary decision. You could also just have this information as the string of numbers. You could just leave it and do nothing to it. So. Do you see that really um, this stage of the algorithm to take this information and make it into the picture, this, this bit of poetic license is conveniently ignored whenever we consider the photograph as being somehow an evidence of something that actually takes place? Yes? Is it because it's at such a micro level that that's not perceivable to our? It's, what is on the micro level? The, the processes that are taking place. So the image which is produced to, to our sort of everyday vision is very comparable to what we imagine something. Well, it's, it's, it's partly correct what you say, but it's not because it's, because it's, not because it's so tiny that we cannot see it. Mm -hmm. It's not because it's, it's not quantum physics here. No, it's something else. It's because the camera is a black box. And what is a black box? It's a device that has an input Something happens and then there is an output. And what happens, we don't know. And more importantly, we don't want to know. We don't care. That is, that's what happens. The question is, why we don't care? Why we don't want to know? That's, what we, that's, what, that's the question Heidegger is asking. Heidegger is asking, why wouldn't we open up the black box to see what really is going on? And now, if you're sitting, sitting here thinking, well, yeah, it's all very well about the digital image, but the analog image is really what actually happened, preserved in silver and silicon. Well, this is also not the case. Um, I don't know if I need to explain it to you now, but, but, um, but let's just, because I don't want to uh, waste, to, not to wait, but I don't want to take too much time with this. Let's just say what happened with the analog image is exactly the same thing. Um, there is also, uh, yes. So, we were talking about yesterday, and talking about it before, A equals A, A can equal B. Is the black box the equal sign? Very true, very good. That is a profound, sorry. That is a profound uh, comment, Ryan. Um, sorry. Yeah, A equal A is the equal sign is the black box. The equal sign is the black box. For those who are new to this uh, seminar, that might sound a little insane. Um, but um, what does it mean? It means that there is an input coming from the left-hand side of the, of, the, of the formula. The input can be anything you like. It can be uh, an object. It can be a string of numbers. It can be uh, a, any kind of entity. It gets into the black box. And, it, and so that, but what comes in is data. What comes out is information. How information is being converted to data, that is the secret of the black box. Yeah? You know these boxes uh, in, um, in uh, kind of uh, uh, fairy grounds when you put your hand in? Yeah, you, you, like, you like that? And then um, it can chop your hand or something like that, give you candy or something like that. Yeah. So that's what the black box is. You don't know what is it doing. Um, data comes from one end, information outputs from the other. These days when we talk about the black box, we normally talk about the computer <coughs> that takes data and processes it into information algorithmically. But there are very simple, uh, there are another very simple black box is simply, simply the photographic frame. Whatever is in a photographic fra frame somehow changes into an image, and whatever is outside is not an image. Okay, but I think we now have enough 
of the question. So the question that Heidegger is asking is, how do we get into the black box? That's the question. And as I said, what is great about Heidegger is that he is asking the question that no one did ask before. Now, part of the problem is that you sometimes feel that maybe these questions are better remained unasked if they lead you towards joining the Nazi party. Maybe it's better, one second, maybe it's better <coughs> not to ask these questions. Uh, but these questions seem to be really important. And I think we, are, we, we keep asking them. We keep asking them knowing that they can also be dangerous questions. Laura. Um, I mean, maybe this goes too far now. I will tell you. Like talk about it another time. So um, after yesterday, I was wondering, um, what are what are the, the questions and maybe the answers that we found that kind of draw him to the Nazi regime? Laura, this is very good because last night I was thinking I actually we actually didn't touch on that. Yeah. yeah we, we sort of we said that his philosophy is both intriguing and dangerous, but we didn't show. Now, you will see today, but to give it to you very simply, Heidegger is in search of authenticity. He is after the authentic. He is concerned that Western civilization lost its, its sense of authenticity. Uh, the authentic became pushed to one side, and instead we have the rational, the logical, the reasonable representation. So. Um, because everything now is done for profit, everything now is done industrially with the maximum uh, cost-benefit uh, calculation for maximum uh, exploitation of the environment, um, we lost the authentic, the authentic sense of belonging to this world, of being one with it, of being part of it. Uh, with Heidegger, the Green Movement and the Gaia Movement really begins its philosophical foundation. Because Heidegger was saying, you and your world are one. You do not start, if you start destroying your world, you destroy yourself. You cannot start fracking in your backyard without that fracking also destroying you. If you think that you can go and uh, mine this land for coal to improve your bank balance, if you think that you can uh, build factories uh, in order to, um, to make a million, and that will not affect you, you are wrong. Because the, same, the moment you start exploiting a, a thing, you immediately start exploiting a person. And when you start exploiting a person, you also start seeing yourself as exploitable. And when you start seeing yourself as exploitable, your sense of what does it mean to be a human being is inadvertently lost. You stop being a human, you become something else, a subject. That's why I was saying that I don't think the subject is necessarily a Heideggerian term. Um, and once you are a subject, your connection to the authentic being is gone. Now, you can see how in the 1930s, 1933, 1935, the Nazi story, basically what the Nazis offered at that time, what the Nazi party offered, was a kind of a pushback on the industrialization of everything. They were sort of offering a kind of opposition to the so-called Americanization. And Americanization was a very important term in the first half of the 20th century in Europe. And that meant, you know, in America everything is about profits. It's about, you know, guys in shiny Gucci shoes making these billion, uh, billion uh, dollar deals. Uh, destroying the environment, having no respect for culture, having no respect for tradition. Uh, it's, it's this sort of um, totally opposed to all European traditional values of continuity, of your little garden and your little step in front of the door and, and the safe, cozy environment you build for yourself and the neighbors you, you, you take time to talk to in the morning and you know, the hundreds of years of history that your little town embodies, you know, and the kind of the, the cathedral, the church bells that ring on Sunday. All this sense of tradition, the American, the Americanization of everything seemed to oppose. You know, it was all about the automobile, the go faster, go get richer, 
go higher, you know, and consume rubbish popular culture. Uh, so what the Nazi party seemed to offer is a pushback at this acceleration of everything. Kind of saying, well, but what about our Teutonic German values? What about our um, German mythology? What about the great black forest? You know, what about the, the wisdom of the German farmer? You know, and at, there was a period of time when this way of talking appealed to many well-meaning people because at the, at, at the first years, the Nazi party didn't say, let's start from killing all Jews and all homosexuals and, uh, and, and all uh, Roma people. No, they were saying, let's look after the forests. Let's look after the rivers. You know, let's, you know, celebrate the, 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 the pure mountain peaks. And many people found that very enticing because it seemed that here there is a movement that wants to preserve the traditional values, kind of argues for uh, the European values of life. Um, and soon enough, these values were overcome by um, racism and anti-Semitism and, uh, yes? It is interesting though because, I mean, Sorry, um, it is interesting though because um, alongside this like promotion of the so-called like Heimat, yeah. so the yeah. your far motherland, your fatherland, as we call it, um, that also came with uh, building motorways. Exactly, so yeah, example, the Bauhaus. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, and uh, I mean, Germany suffered from a huge depression. Yeah. For example, so they also before before the Nazis came to power. Yeah. Yeah. Well. Yeah, it's, it's all true. There were, there were many economic reasons and various other reasons why the Nazis got support. The, the fact that there was a massive recession in the 20s uh, caused, uh, and, and sort of the, the recession is affected especially deeply the middle class person, the small shopkeeper, the small manufacturing um, outfit, because they were overtaken by big conglomerates. So this push against anti-Americanism in the first years of their um, kind of um, when when the Nazis first appeared, they were all they were all for the small person against the big corporations, uh, against the, the big group corporation, you know, and and of course later they became these corporations. Yeah. Uh, so and and that is very interesting with with uh, fascist movements how they f find a way to appeal both to working class and to middle class against the big guys. And once they come to power, they become the big guys. Now, if you want to explore this a little bit more in depth, Laura, because we really don't have time, and it would be very, very good to have a, se a session on fascism, and we might do. Uh, but one text you could definitely look at is Wilhelm Reich, Mass Psychology of Fascism. <coughs> and again, I'm going to Amazon just for, uh, for speediness. I don't recommend Amazon to anyone. Uh, Great book, Mass Psychology of Fascism. Uh, I think I, I can put it on Dropbox as well. Um, but there you can find out um, a lot about, uh, about these things that, that, that you are asking. I uh, highly recommend it. Um, I was talking about it in my Tate lecture about, about this book. Um, okay, let's just, yeah. So Heidegger says, uh, does it answer the, the question of why, what was so appealing and dangerous? Yeah, so Heidegger, says Western thinking, Western mindset West, West became deeply inauthentic. What causes inauthenticity? Rationality. You have a question? Yeah. Thinking about what I was saying, does he? Does he uh, is he going to help us now or is he going to stop us from going to the text? I don't know. I just hope it's Okay. So he, he, he's talking about the means. Let's, okay. Let me stop you, let me stop you. Let's see what he is actually saying. Let's go to the text. Wait, 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 stop. We, because we're going now to the text, okay? I know it's always a, a scary moment when that, when that begins. Uh, but... I, 
I want you to read this text, this, these two paragraphs we read yesterday. We're going to read them again and we're going to tweak them a little bit to, uh, to make them a little bit more provocative. So could someone read to us? We are uh, in a question concerning in, in the age of the world picture, page 116. So could someone read to us clear as a bell, slowly and with gravitas? These two paragraphs by Heidegger. Charlie. One of the one of the essential phenomena of the modern age is its science. A phenomenon a phenomenon of no less importance is machine technology. We must not, however, misinterpret the technology as the mere application of modern mathematical or physical science to process. <coughs> machine technology is itself an autonomous transformation. Of Praxis, a type of transformation where in praxis first demands the employment of mathematical physical science. Machine technology remains up to now the most visible outgrowth of the essence of modern technology, which is identical to the essence of modern metaphysics. Okay, stop, stop here, stop there. Anyone has any sense of what the hell Heidegger is talking about here? I'll give you 10 seconds to think about it. Tough? Hard to understand? Hard to understand? Uh, what about you guys, the, our, um, our guests? Any, any thoughts about that? Um, you don't have to, but, but anything? What about the first sentence? So rationality for the Western society became what? How would well, you put it? Sort of like enlightenment ideals. Yes. Of like science. As yes. The sort of supreme yeah. form of truth. Exactly. Um, I'm a little unclear what you think about machine technology. Okay. Versus, uh, but what do you think he says in the last sentence? Machine technology remains up to now the most visible outgrowth of the essence of modern technology, which is identical with the essence of modern metaphysics. How do you understand that song, that sentence? The, basically, if I if I am right here, he says something like technology equals metaphysics. So he seems to be conflating two very different areas. Metaphysics? What is metaphysics? Hello, help. Well, what is metaphysics? It's the idea of something. It's the idea of something. That's quite good. Uh, Metaphysics, abstract theory with no basis in reality, principles of things. Metaphysics deals with the first principles, yeah? First principles are what? Like, you know, in a religious environment, let's say in Christian environment, the first principles are perhaps the Ten Commandments, yeah? Um, so metaphysics is the first foundational ideas about life. And here he is seeming to be saying that the essence of modern technology, or that modern technology is metaphysics. So he basically says that when you walk into Dixon's, do you know what is Dixon's? When you walk into Maplin's, do you know what is Maplin's? Ah, oh, Maplin's is not no more. Uh, when you walk into, um, help, help me out here. Huh? No, no, not Harrods. No, I, I, a kind of electronics shop. No, 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 no. Electronics. Best Buy. Yeah, Best Buy. Best Buy. Okay. So when you walk into an electronics shop, he says you walk into a church because that. That's where you see the first principles of your society laid out bare. <coughs> it's exactly the same as the church. Why? Because the essence of modern technology is identical to the essence of modern metaphysics. I just want you to notice 
that here, beginning from a very innocuous first sentence, that essential for the phenomenon of modern age is science, a kind of sentence every one of you could write in your essay, and there is nothing um, but particularly outrageous about it, he ends up within the space of three sentences, saying something which is completely outrageous. At least, I want you to hear it as quite outrageous, because it says that, you know what, guys? Technology is your religion. Not only religion, it's also your mommy and daddy. Yeah? Technology is not, you're not only dependent on it, it's not only kind of holding you by the throat, you know, and then telling you, you will use social media, or, you know, you, you will not leave the house without the phone. But it's much more than that. It's your Bible. It's your code of behavior. It's your ethical principles. Yeah? It's all that religion used to be. That's what he's actually saying, which is pretty outrageous. Now, you see, Laura, how... Of course, he's not saying that, that, oh, look how great it is. He's pointing out that we inadvertently slided into a place where our technology became our moral compass or our uh, philosophy. Yeah, or our faith, or kind of our reason to be alive. Yeah, and he says it's a terrible thing that happened because we slide it into this place without ever having could, uh, having kind of a collective decision. Should we actually go down this route? You know, why are we doing it to ourselves? Um, as I showed you yesterday, um, there was a moment after the signing of the Paris Paris Accords when Barack Obama came on stage and said, this is the best chance we have to save the one planet we got. And you really have to ask, well, excuse me, but where were you? You, you know, you and all the other leaders, <laughs> how did you get us to this place? And why, why no one is in the dock for getting us to a place where there is one chance left to save the one last planet, one planet we got? Yeah, because if it was a train driver, they would be disqualified from ever driving if they brought the train like a, you know, one millisecond from a crash. Yeah? At the very least, they wouldn't be driving. So, why no one is asking, how did we get to that point? That is Heidegger's question. Let's do a little exercise now, just to see how this text can speak to you more directly. Because sometimes you kind of wonder, I mean, wouldn't it be nice if, let's say, someone like Heidegger was alive now to tell us what the heck is going on with our life now? Because, okay, that was, he was writing in the 60s, but in 1960s, but what about 2019? So there is a way to make Heidegger speak to you directly about what you are interested in. So, um, so let's do it now, let's do it in this way. Um, Chavi, let's read it one more time, starting from this sentence here from machine technology. Yeah, just, just, so just this part. Um, now. Wait, 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 wait. I have that's some, that's some rules to follow here. Um, so instead of machine technology, read photography. Yes? Instead of uh, mathematical, physical science, Read representation, and if you need to make any other adjustments, just do what 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 we see fit. Photography is itself an autonomous transformation of praxis, a type of transformation wherein praxis first demands the employment of representation. Photography remains up to now the most visible outgrowth of the essence of modern technology, modern technology which is identical with the essence of modern metaphysics. Okay, good. Helps. It's good, no? Very easy. You can do it with whatever it is you are working on. And Heidegger will always tell you, like I Ching, will always tell you what is, what path to follow. Um, so you can use this technique whenever you need to, and whenever you're out there, you, you're thinking of a topic. Now, I'm not suggesting that some people took it very literally and in their essays. They just basically rewrote Heidegger or Foucault, whatever, with just replacing some keywords. I, that is not my suggestion that that's how you write. It's, it's a tool to enable your own thinking. 
Yeah, not uh, it's not a quick way to uh, plagiarize a text. Okay. Um, now, so Heidegger is saying here, if our little replacement of technology for photography is true, is that um, photography is the most visible outgrowth of the essence of modern technology. And that, I think, is true because photography is to do with the visual. So, of course, it is the most visible because it is to do with what is visible. And that is, by the way, why on this course we look at photography and not, let's say, at motoring or uh, washing machines or toasters. We could investigate any of these things because all of them are to do with modern technology. Photography is uniquely placed to understand the technological environment we live in because photography is the most visual manifestation of, it, of this environment. It is as if the, the, the visual environment through photography takes its own self-portrait or writes its own biography. Yeah? So that's what we are dealing with. We are dealing with the code. This technological environment is keep writing and we try to decipher this code. Yeah? Any questions? Uh, okay. Um, do you want a break? Are you okay to continue? Break? Let's do 10 minutes. So I will see you back here at 2 minutes to 12. into the next section. Um, <clears throat> right. So Heidegger gives us five identifiers, if you like, of five sort of uh, symptoms, that's a good word, five symptoms of more the modern age the modern age of advanced technology. He identifies, he sees it, I'm giving it straight away, he sees it as a disease. Modernity is a kind of rush, yeah? And there are five symptoms of this rush. First, as a good doctor, Heidegger, he identifies the symptoms, and then based on the symptoms, he identifies the causes, based on the causes, he identifies the cure, okay? That's what you get when you go to Dr. Heidegger. Mm -hmm. so, uh, so the first one is machine technology becomes identical with religion. We got that, yeah? Now, um, so can someone read the third one? I don't know what was the, f why, why we have, why we already the second. Um, no, I think we already covered two. Okay, the third one. So um, can Laura read, please? If you, if you don't mind. Um, no one has to read if they don't want to, but if you don't mind, Laura? Yeah. Um, a third equally essential phenomenon of the modern period lies in the event of arts moving into the purview of aesthetics. That means that the artwork becomes the object of mere subjective experience, and that consequently, art is considered to be an expression of human life. Okay. Uh, any thoughts about that? Start thinking. <laughs> I'm interested in what's aesthetic. Okay, good. Uh, it's good that you're interested. What, what anyone, anyone has any thoughts about that text? What does he say? Yes. Um, I was thinking that maybe in this context he sees aesthetics as something decorative. Good. Than yeah, and what does it mean? I mean, that that's also goes to what James is asking. Um, the kind of... Yes, art is aesthetics, and what is your problem? What, well, yes? Is he saying that it's uh, too rooted in subjectivity and not rooted in like, authenticity and capture? Very good, very good, yeah. And I think it's, it's, it's a good point. He opposes here obliquely 
subjectivity to authenticity. In a sense, he says, and he doesn't say it yet, but uh, we can um, kind of riff off what C. Stephen said here. He says that um, the subject cannot be authentic. If you, are, if you see yourself as a subject, you are not authentic. For authenticity to exist, there can, there can be no subjectivity. What is subjectivity? Is the I, the individual, the, 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 the kind of the unique existence of my own personal being. As the more that is emphasized in me, the less authentic my experience of life is. Because the authentic experience of life is oneness. Now, I'm kind of giving you a lot of variety, <coughs> different bits of Heidegger that are not anchored in text. So they will come, kind of, my might come together a bit later. But Laura and James are both right in saying that the aesthetic is a kind of decorative. The aesthetic is visually pleasing. Yeah. What does it mean to say that the work of art became aesthetics? It became uh, something that judged by whether it is beautiful or not. Yeah? When something is aesthetically pleasing, it is beautiful. Yeah? So art now tries to be beautiful. Now, the, <coughs> the, the, the philosopher who got into the question of the beautiful as in art is obviously Hegel in his lectures of aesthetics, which we don't read here, but it's a kind of staple for anyone who is interested in, um, in this um, way of thinking about art. Um, but what is important to bear in mind is that there was time before, let's say, the Renaissance in the Middle Ages, when art was not aesthetic, when art was religious, when art was spiritual. And in a sense, you might say what Heidegger is saying is we need to reclaim the spiritual in art. Now, what does it mean to reclaim the spiritual? Maybe the, maybe the artist has to become more of a shaman. I don't know, have you seen... Um, if you've been here a couple of weeks ago when Amy did her performance and showed her video of walking up and down yeah. the room, I thought it was a very shamanistic piece of work. Uh, and, I'm a, and that is just one example. So um, perhaps what Heidegger is saying is that art needs to free itself from the compulsion to make beautiful things, to make nice things. And art needs to concern itself with making things that are spiritual or um, that operate in a different domain, not, not in the domain of the beautiful, maybe in the domain of the sublime. Yeah? So, but we don't talk about the sublime right now. Uh, but the next sentence is important. That means that the artwork becomes the object of mere subjective experience. What is subjective experience is my own point of view. You know how often um, you hear it often in creeds when someone feels that they've been criticized too harshly? They say, oh, but that's just your own, your, that's your opinion. Yeah? And that speaks to, to what Heidegger is saying. So it's kind of subjective, my subjective experience is my own monocular vision of things. Yeah, that's what I see from, from my viewpoint. But is it possible to have a different viewpoint? Is it possible to have not to look at the world not from my one perspective, but from, can I look at a work of art not through my own eyes, but through all of your eyes? Yes? Is it possible? For instance, no? I don't know how you could get out of your own. Well, there is one way, one, one simple way, Gilles Deleuze talks about it in his book, Cinema Time Image. He says, modern cinema does that. By filming the same scene from different angles, simultaneously, it gives you all of these views of this one thing that happens. Basically, it's processed in your yes. head. It still does, yes. But then there, there is a way to get out of it as well. Um, another way, perhaps, is again, artificial intelligence. Um, so, another way, perhaps, is LSD. Um, another way, perhaps, 
is uh, poetry. Um, poetics, because poetry has an ability to transform the subjective experience into something different, into something else. So um, another, another word for the subjective experience is representation. I'm just typing spaces. I don't really know how many letters I have I made here, but it's supposed to be representation. Okay. It's funny because in photography, it, the, the more objective kind of someone thoughts to make their work, the more it feels representation. Exactly. Which is exactly. That's exactly what Heidegger is saying. Mm. He's saying, okay, good. So he's saying, to continue James's thought, art became photography. And that is a bad thing. That's what, that's what he means by saying that art became the subjective experience. What a subject does, a subject does just one thing. A subject represents. How the subject experiences the world as a representation. Now, again, to properly unravel why that is so, we would need to go back a few steps and look at, um, at some things we have already discussed. So we need to slightly move on, uh, and perhaps things will get clearer along the way. A fourth, yes, John? What is the second one? Is it constant? The second one is machine technology. So don't worry about it, it doesn't matter. He gave, he, he said that, we don't need to have all of them. You know, that's not, that's, you know, it's just Heidegger, you know, who cares? Uh, <laughs> a fourth modern phenomenon, put somewhere into us. Hello? So how do you understand this? Anything you can get out of this little paragraph? That another modern phenomenon is that human activity is conceived and consummated as culture. <laughs> what does it mean? Human activity is culture. What does it mean? How do you understand that, Laura? Mm. So culture is something that's developed that's um, outside of nature, I would say, so... What, I mean, let me, let me just ask, just, just so we get a bit closer to what Heidegger had in mind. What else human activity can be if not culture? And it's not nature. Oh, it's like animal. Like animal. Yeah. Like animal behavior. Yeah, that's yeah. No. <laughs> no. Just human activity. Yes. If human activity is not culture, what else can it be? Can it be technology? Machine technology? No. Thinking? No. So no. no. Okay. So you need to re realize that on some level, Heidegger has a little conversation with someone who came before him, another German philosopher that begins with the letter M. So, on some level, Heidegger has a tiny bit of a conversation with Marx, and what Marx said is the essence of human activity? Labor. Labor, Labor. Labor. yeah. So, uh, and Heidegger says, one of the symptoms of modernity is that we see all human activity as culture. We forget that at, its, at the essence, it's labor. Now, labor becomes reified, to use a Marxist term. Reified. Reification. Do you know what is a reification? Is a very, very, very important word. Reification is from the Latin word res. Res means things. 
of a thing. Re is a thing. Reification is basically thinkification. To thinkify something is to start looking at someone or something as a thing. There is a, the, the familiar English equivalent of reification is objectification. So, you know this expression, to objectify someone means not, it doesn't mean to treat them objectively. I used to think that, but I just came here. I thought, well, what's wrong with objectifying? It, it, it seems like a good thing. No, to objectify someone is to treat them as an object. Yeah? When you treat someone as an object, you don't treat them as a human being. So to, to, re to reify something is to see it as a thing. Yes, Laura? Uh, I, I was just thinking, does that mean that he's saying we become detached from our own actions? That's exactly what he's saying. Well done. That's exactly what he's saying. You're doing well. Um, so, by treating everything, by treating labor as culture, we forget the essential quality of labor, the essential dependence of our existence on, on making. And, and for Heidegger, you see, the process of making is always goes in two, in two directions. So for instance, the peasant leaving their house in the morning uh, with a plow to plow the field, plows the field back and forth all day with the oxen and sowing the seeds the, the, the peasant is looking after this land by nurturing it, by, let's say, giving it, um, well, whatever it is, manure or whatever the land needs, and the land in return returns back the crop. Now, what happens is that the peasant is working the land, but in this working the land, in the Heideggerian worldview, the peasant is also working on themselves. And in this plowing of the, of, the, of the land, something is essential is revealed to the peasant about their place in the world. So, so it's not this one-way process. Here's a piece of land. I'm going to you know, plow the heck out of it. You know, I'm just going to get you know, as much seed as possible you know, to, uh, to enrich myself. No. I'm looking after the land, in return the land is also looking after me. Because by plowing it, I go through a transformation. My own labor invested in this earth also teaches me how me and the earth are dependent on each other. Because ultimately, this is the earth where I will lie on my death. So I, 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 I realized my own belonging to this place. I'm not just coming to it from outside, saying, well, I guess we can, you know, um, get our, you know, our first million from this hectare. No, I, um, I fulfill my destiny. And what I get back is a deeper knowledge of my own place in the world. That's what happens for Heidegger in labor. But when labor becomes <coughs> culture, it becomes reified, is like Laura was saying, we become detached. Then, then it's not the farmer anymore looking at the land and saying, well, tomorrow morning the sun is rising, uh, you know, um, red light in the morning, um, shepherd's warning, I will go and plow and provide for the family and I will provide for the earth and the earth will, will provide for me. No, it's the farmer's son who comes and says, Daddy, you've been wasting your time instead of, you know, all this plowing. We're going to build here uh, a shoe factory and we're going to bring some uh, workers from uh, for the Far East and you, know, you never need to work a, a, a day in your life anymore, you know, we, we'll, we'll be you know, driving the Rolls Royce and living in luxury. And it all might happen and it will be a very different life. But Heidegger is saying, at this point, you lose the connection with the earth, you lose the sense of who you are, and once you start exploiting the earth for the resources it has, you yourself become exploited too. Okay? 
So do you see why this thinking is both deeply seductive and somehow seems deeply relevant and it's also kind of offering a form of salvation on the one hand and a form of, one second, and is also dangerous on the other, yes? I, I just had to know, I mean, this is really, really dark humor and I don't even find it funny, but I was just thinking it's so paradox because, I mean, the Nazis and yeah. the um, concentration yeah. camps, they basically wrote labor free, labor makes you free? They, they wrote Labour Makes You Free and they also made the, what, what he says here about machine technology, they made machine technology into the killing machine yeah. and they, they, they made killing a machine technology. So yes, but what fascism does is that it always begins from making a certain set of promises which are incredibly seductive and appealing and of course then um, turns back on them. And what is, you'd say, uh, if you want to understand how a fascist movement comes to power, one thing you need to understand, it's not one or two or three or five or 20 individuals who decide to take a, a country by force and install a fascist regime, like something that happens in Brazil right now. This is not fascism, this is dictatorship. It's very different. Fascism is what's happening in the, in the United States now. Because there you have a movement, 80 million people, a mass of people who suddenly decide that certain things are good for us. And how that happens, this is the question. That's why reading Heidegger is so important, because you see how seductive this argument is. Now, my grandmother used to have um, a little garden outside her house where she used to grow cucumbers. Now, um, now, if you, let's say, wash the floor of the house with bleach, and you have this bucket of bleach, she wouldn't pour it in the garden where the cucumbers grow, because then nothing will grow for many years. You kind of understand that. You don't, you don't destroy, you, you don't pollute your backyard with chemicals. It's, it's, it's so self-evident, it doesn't bear, uh, it doesn't need saying. Uh, that's what Heidegger is talking about. Once you start polluting your backyard, uh, well, once you forget that the backyard is the place where your cucumbers grow, once you just think, oh, well, that's, that's a nice place to pour out my ammonia, um, well, then you really have no chance of, uh, of surviving. It's, you, you're finished. And that's what he's talking about. So this, this is completely, um, it, yeah, you know, it is ironic. There is the dark humor in his writing, but it's important to understand that what we today recognize as the green movement, what we today recognize as the ecological uh, um, kind of philosophy, originates not in small part from Heidegger. Um, and I'm not saying, it, I'm, I'm not suggesting for a moment that this sort of the, the ecological movement is uh, is fascist. No, I'm just saying. It's a very complex picture. And uh, dangerous fascist movements will exploit any, any opening. For instance, have you, uh, did you watch this uh, television series, uh, The Handmaid's Tale? Yeah. The Handmaid's Tale, have you, watched, uh, have you been watching that? Yeah. Yeah, now what is interesting there is that in this sort of um, dystopian uh, republic, what is it called? Uh, Gilead, Gilead, no, um, Gilead. G Gilead, Gilead, yeah. Uh, it's very ecological. In a sense, it's, it's, it's established in response to the pollution of the environment. Yeah? So that's very interesting how fascism can use concerns for the planet to its, for its own means. Now, I'm not saying that, that in order to be ecological you need to be a fascist. You can, you can very well be a, a <coughs> ecological and hold different positions. I'm just saying you need to be aware of the seduction of these views and how they can often be turned around. The same thing actually happens with something like identity politics, which for a long time was the domain of the left. You know, the rights of minorities, the rights of gays, the rights of uh, um, people of different races, 
um, and suddenly it's somehow being co-opted into very different political narratives. So this is just it just means that as a as a person who needs to somehow manage to survive the 21st century and hopefully also do something uh, helpful and ethical and positive in this century, you need to understand how complex is this environment is and how the, how there are no simple solutions. You know, just by recycling, not going to save you. You know, recycling is not yet politics. Okay, a fifth a fifth phenomenon of the modern age. Someone else. Yes. A fifth phenomenon of the modern age is the loss of the gods. This expression does not mean the mere doing away with the gods, gross atheism. The loss of the gods is a twofold process. On one hand, the world picture is Christianized, and as much as the cause of the world is posited as infinite, unconditional, absolute. On the other hand, Christendom, Christendom transforms Christian doctrine into a worldview, the Christian worldview and in that way makes itself modern and up-to-date. The loss of the gods is a situation of indecision regarding God and the gods. Christendom has the greatest share in bringing it about, but the loss of the gods is so far from excluding a religion. I think that's enough, that's enough. Because it's, uh, yeah, he's going on a little bit here. Uh, but I just want to talk about this, the loss of the gods. Now, obviously the loss of the gods is not Nietzsche, is not Heidegger's own uh, idea. Whose idea it is? I just said Nietzsche. exactly right. Yeah. So Nietzsche, uh, Friedrich Nietzsche, the great um, German philosopher, um, that you all should be reading if you want to understand. Uh, I mean, there's no no one else is more helpful for artists. Um, now, Nietzsche has its problems. His problems. He can be deeply irritating. He has some outrageously <coughs> stupid views as well. Uh, as most of these philosophers do, most of them are misogynists and racists, um, and that's just how it is, you know. And until we get into, let's say, the uh, 1960s and we start reading uh, some um, feminist philosophers like Lucy Rigaray, Donna Haraway, um, yeah, most of them are real dicks, you know. And I'm, I'm, I'm sorry to say, Nietzsche also was uh, was. Uh, one of them. Um, they have things. They have interesting things to say, and that just how it is. It's just part of the complexity of these things. We never read those people who are nice. We read those who are interesting, and sometimes those who are dangerous. This is my my uh, criteria. That's why, by the way, we read Western philosophy, not because it is the best philosophy. Because it is the one that does the most damage. Okay, so um, even though others com are com competing with, with that quite well, so maybe one day we will have to to move uh, east. Uh, okay, um, a fifth phenomenon of the modern age is the loss of the gods. So Nietzsche said, "God is dead." He said it in the in the second half of the 19th century. Now many people before Nietzsche said, "God is dead," but they meant it in a way that. Oh my, you know, people forget God. People forget to follow the good book. People don't follow the guidelines of what does it mean to live a good life. That, that's what normally people meant by God is dead. Look at these people. They, they, it's it's like as if there is no God for them. When Nietzsche says God is dead, he says something else. He says... There is no God anymore because we live in the age of reason, of rationality, of mathematics. We point to Galileo, point his, his telescope to the skies, and lo and behold, there is no God. Copernicus showed us that Earth is not the center of the world, so lo, lo and behold, there is no God. Newton explained to us how everything moves without any, anyone holding all the pieces together, just you know, by its own forces. So we know there is no God. The tragedy is not that there is no God. The tragedy is that we keep behaving as if there is. We still keep believing, even though we know there is no God, we didn't let this knowledge sink deep enough into ourselves to really modify our behavior. Yeah, that is the tragedy. 
And uh, the, the place where it discusses it the most clearly is in uh, Thus Spoke Zarathustra, where he has this uh, speech of the madman. The madman, that's the a story that Zarathustra says, tells. A madman comes back from the mountain. No, 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 sorry. Zarathustra from the mountain. A mad, uh, the madman appears in the square, in the town square, with a lamp during daylight and walking around with a kind of with a burning lamp. And when people ask him, what are you doing? He says, I'm, I'm looking for God. Where is God? What have you done with it? Then he says, oh my God, you killed God. You know, like you killed Kenny. You killed God. <laughs> and uh, where is God? You killed him. What have you done to him? How could you do such a thing? You know, how, do you, how could you drink the whole sea? And, and then he looks at the people. The people sort of look at him and say, oh God. Fucking madman. He's just like, you know, an idiot. And uh, I look at him and say, Oh, I came too early. You don't get it yet. You still don't understand. Now, Nietzsche has a bad reputation because he is seen as a kind of the precursor of the Nazi movement. And I'm here to tell you this is bullshit. Nietzsche has absolutely nothing to do with the Nazis, even though the Nazis venerated Nietzsche and um, made him, or were trying to make him kind of the, the voice of this idea. They, they, they use this notion of the superhuman, of the uberman, to justify their racist theories. If Nietzsche was alive when the Nazis came to power, he would probably die of shame. He hated Germans anyway, you know. Um, he hated everyone, but I think particularly Ge Germans and English he, he particularly hated above everyone else. Uh, and, 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 and he would, you know, not spare his wrath from the, uh, from the Nazi movement. But as it happened, his sister, who inherited his uh, archive and, and, and kind of um, took ownership of his writings after his death, she was actually married to, uh, to a proto-Nazi. He even went with him to Argentina to try to set up a kind of a, a Nazi colony there. Um, and she was even photographed, sort of, uh, you know, um, hanging out with uh, Hitler. Um, so um, he does have this concept of the, of the superhuman, but his superhuman has nothing to do with the Aryan race. The notion of the superhuman simply means this is the human that will come <coughs> out of recognition that God is dead. For hundreds of centuries, we've been living in the shadow of God. There was someone out there to make our decisions for us. Someone to tell us what is good and what is bad. To give meaning to it all. Just like the party in China. Yeah? But now God is dead. There is no party. You are on your own. There is no ground. There is no good or bad. There is just the abyss. And you are falling through it. And nothing will ever stop this fall. Because you just keep falling. Now what you do? Now what is your meaning of life? Now what are you going to hold on to? That's what, out of this sense of the abyss, out of this sense that there is no party, there is no God, there is no Ten Commandments, you need to figure out for yourself what this life is about. Out of this understanding, Nietzsche says, a new human will emerge. The superhuman. The super human, the above human, because free from the notion that there is a daddy and a mommy who look after you, who make sure that everything is going to be okay. Because everything not going to be okay, you are here simply by accident, some accidental uh, atoms hitting each other sufficient number of times to make someone something like you and this is all your life, you know? And your pain and your suffering and your anxiety and your hopes and your fears, it is absolutely nothing. And there is nothing to get, there is nothing to look forward to. There is only this fall into the abyss. And then, and then she says, well, if that really is the case, how, what can we hold on to? He identifies one thing, I mentioned it to you on Tuesday, and that is the will to power. He says, in this abyss, the one thing that, that is still real, the one thing that you can actually do, make sense of, is that 
you want to be alive, you want to live, you have this will to live, your will to live compels you in an hour to go and get lunch. Yet, this is your will to power. And believe me, uh, if you are in the queue and uh, the food is scarce, you will be pushing your way into the, to the counter to get your uh, bowl of soup. That is the will to power. That is the force that compels you to live. And Nietzsche says, this is all there is. You want a foundation, you want a ground under your feet, uh, the party will not give it, my main daddy will not give it, God will not give it, even mathematics, you know, even logic, none of these things will give it to you because guess what? Mathematics and logic and even time itself, these are all your own inventions. <coughs> 2 plus 3 equals 5, but is that universally valid? Is it always the case? No. No, it's only in this little corner of the universe. <coughs> so, that's why <coughs> Heidegger is talking about the loss of gods. Um, moving on to the actual, so these were the symptoms. Dr. Heidegger identified uh, five uh, symptoms, the good doctor. And now, the disease. The disease now is being named. So who could read to us this? Just one sentence. What understanding of what is, what interpretation of truth lies at the foundation of these phenomena. Okay. Now, as I, as I said, Heidegger is about asking good questions. This is a good question. The question is, what understanding of truth is behind <coughs> all these symptoms we identified? Now, <coughs> this is a good question because people often talk about truth and post-truth. Very rarely someone asks, what do you mean by truth? So I'm asking you now, what do you mean by truth? What is truth? Anyone? What is truth? No one knows. You never, you never heard this word before. Is a new concept for you. No one knows. You never used it before. What is truth? Truth. What is it? That. Truth. Yeah. My, my <laughs> it's such a, It's a really hard question. <laughs> what is truth? One second, Ryan. Maybe the truth is not always true? I didn't know. Tell me why. That that's, that's not, doesn't answer the question. What is true? Ryan. Uh, something that cannot be disproven. Cannot be disproven. Okay, truth is that which is not truth. So, yeah, okay. A bit tautological. Anyone knows what truth is? I feel like it's a consensus. Okay, so, so as long as there was a consensus that the um, sun rotates around the earth, that was true. Yes? Okay, so what is truth? What is not false? Okay, that doesn't help us. And what is false? <laughs> what, is, what is not true? So we are, we are back to tautology. Look, do you know what is a tautology? In philosophy, it's an important situation is when you explain something, when you take for granted what you try to prove. Yeah? When you say truth is that which is not false and false is that which is not truth, we didn't learn anything. So avoid tautologies. What is truth? How come you don't know? I'm shocked. 
should it be uh, support from science? Support from science. Yeah. yeah, truth is that what science tells us is true. Okay. Well, yeah, maybe. And how do we know that it's actually true? Mm. Science knows diff science tells different things at different times. Yeah. It's yeah. Uh, yeah. Sorry? Something already happened. And so something that happened is true. And most of people think it's right. Consensus. So most people used to think that the sun rotates around the earth. It was true then? For, for most people, it's true. So what is truth? What is the difference between a truth and a belief then? Or yeah, the truth yes. is reality. Huh? Truth is reality. Truth is reality. Okay, and how do how do you mean? What do you mean by that? Well, it's, I, I suppose it's the product of, product of our, our reason, our rationality. It's okay, maybe truth is truth close is to faith. So, truth is faith. Truth is faith. So, uh, three plus two is five because I believe so. Yes. Truth is nature. Nature. Yes. Wait, 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 wait. Yes. No, no, go ahead. And like the highest form of empiricism, or like the, the furthest form of like deduction. Okay. Something that cannot be represented. Why? Because if you can make a replica, then it's not. I'm shocked that you don't know what is true. How, how did you survive so far in life? Why you never ask yourself? Why you, why you never question what people mean when they talk about truth? People talk about post-truth. Okay, let, let it go. Let, let, let's talk about pre-post. Let's talk about truth first, Laura. Maybe truth truth is what I feel. Okay, <coughs> truth is what you feel, and so truth. so my truth and your truth will be completely different because. I feel happy, you feel sad, our truth is completely different. Okay, is that what truth is? <coughs> that everyone has their own? Yes? Um, I'm going to try. <laughs> go ahead, go truth ahead. is facts in the world of its entirety. Facts, okay. Truth is facts. Okay, but, but that kind of still differs the question. What are the facts? And then facts are true. Yeah? Fact. What, what do we know what facts is? Fact is, uh, true is a law of the facts. None of you knows what is true. And I, I'm shocked. As if what actually exists or actually happened. Yeah, but you see, again, but what actually means doesn't help. Yes? Yeah, and truth is uh, never change and in any environment is right. Sorry? It's unlimited. Unlimited? It's never changing. Never, always that. Always there. always there. How do you know when? The, how do you know when some? What is always there? Like the air. Air is true. Maybe air is uh, forever. What is it? Like wood is wood is truth. Wood. Like wood is wood is truth. But that's tautology. To say that wood is wood is tautology. Is truth tautology? Is truth saying? But it doesn't explain anything. Yes? Truth is what it is. Okay, that's another tautology. And what, what, it, what does it mean to say? What does it mean, truth is what it is? Because it questions truth itself. What does it mean? Do you understand? The basis when you are reasoning and questioning your truth, that's when you find truth. You find truth when? When you question and reason. And how do you know that what you found is truth? You never know. So, so truth is just can be anything. It can be anything, but it, it becomes okay. Okay, we are getting somewhere. Truth can be anything. Are you happy with that? Yeah. Is is the good working say, hypothesis for truth? <laughs> so, when you are uh, required in court, I swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, you can just say anything. Basically. Yeah. Yeah. Are you serious? Yes. Yeah. You navigate. Oh, oh. 
All of you, just go home. <laughs> Are you serious? When you say, I swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth, you can say anything? So if you think something, it makes it true? Well, basically, because yeah. if our consensus of what truth is is just what everybody believes to be true. No, no, no. no. Jesus. Okay, like shut up everyone. <laughs> <laughs> now, none of you knows what truth is, and which is fine, I didn't expect you to know. I just wanted you to realize the horror of the situation. Truth this little four-letter word is being used all the time in various different contexts. And everyone, including you, behaves as if you know what it means. You don't seem to have the faintest idea. Now, just think how easy you are to manipulate. How easy, how, you will believe anything, anything, because you don't know what truth is. You have no criterion to decide whether something is true or something is false or something is an ideology or a fairy tale or propaganda. You are incredibly naive and vulnerable. You really are a fodder for any kind of fascist leader who will come along and sell you some kind of uh, lotion, some kind of stories. So I'm worried about you people. If you don't have a way to distinguish between truth and lies. How you propose to move on in life? And perhaps, how you propose to avoid someone, how do you propose to arm yourself against someone who tells you lies? You have no way of doing that. And you are not alone. This is, this is what, what, what is exactly what is happening. Okay, so, now, I'm going to tell you what truth is, and so we didn't even yet get, we didn't got yet to the point at which Heidegger um, criticizes the notion of truth, because we don't even know what notion he, he set up to criticize. Okay, so. Now, as always, not always, but as often in the case, the dictionary can offer a little hint of what is, what is going on. Now, I'm saying it with a reservation because never begin an essay with a dictionary definition. Mm -hmm. Even if you write your, your, your essay about truth, definitions generally don't help. But um, <coughs> and the definition of truth in the dictionary is really only a starting point for the discussion. But that which is in accordance with fact or reality. Yeah? So the operative term here is accordance. Yeah? Accordance, um, what does it mean accordance? What is, what, what is accord? What is accord? In harmony? Yeah, exactly. <coughs> yeah. That which is in harmony with fact or reality. But where do you think this harmony is taking place? So if I have three notes on my piano and I strike them together and they are in harmony, we can say it's a, it's a chord. Or if I strike a chord, yes? Um, it's like a... Uh, something that happens outside of yourself and then you interpret it and it's as close as it possibly That's very could good, be. Ali. That's really good. So truth is correspondence between a reality and the mental image of it. <coughs> this is what truth is. Nothing more, nothing less. It is the correspondence between reality and the mental image of it. Sorry? No. Say it again? Okay, now, did you get that? So, please, don't write it down as the definition of truth, because this is not the definition, this is the problem. You didn't even manage to get to the problem. 
you were like sort of blindfolded toddlers, you know, uh, swarming around. But uh, <coughs> truth is a what does it mean to correspond? If I correspond with you, we send letters to each other. Yeah, this is correspondence. Co respond. Co together and respond. Yeah. So truth is a correspondence between a mental image and reality. So the key <coughs> question we need to inquire is what is correspondence? So if you like, this is the formula of truth. Truth has its own formula, and the formula is A equal A. Let's say that A is the mental image you have in your head, and the other A is reality. If they correspond, this statement is true. If they don't correspond, this statement is false. Yes? I have a hypothetical, I guess. So. What if the other A is upside down? Or, or, you know what I mean? Like, if it's still true, but in a different manner. Yes, then what? I, I don't know, I'm just saying, is it, is it still true, or is it something else? Well, I didn't say that this is true, I'm just saying this is how, this is the formula that expresses what truth means. So, if one of the A's is in a different form, then what does it mean? I really want to, you know, you, you need to think about it. I don't want to give answers because I'm not, I want you to question this model, not to take it as, not, not to sort of tattoo it on your hand, you know, now because from now on, you know, I, you know what truth is. This, is. this is not the answer. I hope you understand. <laughs> this is the problem. We so far didn't manage to get to the problem. This is the problem. The problem is... Yes, Laura? I was thinking truth is just conditional. If, uh, no. It depends on... Didn't we just say what truth is? Truth is the correspondence between a mental image and a state of affairs. Yeah, but it depends on a pre-perceived notion of, of what? reality. It depends on many things. It depends on your mental image. It depends on the notion of correspondence. It depends on what you mean by reality. Yes, it depends on all these things. So, okay. So we need metaphysics in order to, um, in order to develop Look, 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 look. Let's not bring metaphysics because I think people already have quite a lot happening in their heads right now. But we will get there. We will get to metaphysics. So, what you need to understand fundamentally about how truth is and this, how truth is understood in the contemporary environment is as correspondence between a mental image and reality. Now you have certain equipment to allow you to understand why a photograph is automatically considered true. Why is it? Because it... Yes, John? Picture of reality. No, can you, because the, the image is, is understood as corresponding to reality. Because there is a correspondence. Yeah? Now, of course, this correspondence needs to be questioned. That's what Heidegger is doing. He wants to us to figure out where this correspondence is coming from. Yeah? So, that is the challenge. So, when Heidegger says, what understanding of what is, what interpretation of truth lies in at, at the foundation of this phenomenon, he is asking, what formula of truth allowed all these phenomena to happen? The formula of truth that allowed this phenomena to happen is this. So, this is the cause of the disease. You come to Dr. Heidegger and say, Dr. Heidegger, I have rash over, all over my body, my joints ache, I have 
migraine, I have all these symptoms. I have five different symptoms. He looks at them and says, yes, I can see that you have different, these different symptoms. And my, my diagnosis is that you suffer from the truth disease, my friend. You have the truth. You got the, you got the truth. And I will prescribe a treatment. Yeah. So the truth is the disease. The disease is the truth. We now came to figure out what is wrong with this age of modernity. What is wrong with it is the truth. So you see, we're not just wasting time in this seminar uh, going over familiar ground and asking some kind of stupid questions. Uh, we really go to the very heart of the, the, the real questions that being asked in the political in the environment, in the public domain. People argue about truth and post-truth and how can you tell the difference. Heidegger says truth and of course post-truth is not a solution. It is the malaise. It, truth is the problem. Yes, Simon. Um, just, I guess it's a little off topic, but is there a difference between fascist and anti-fascist movement. How that fits with what we discussed? It's just something that's on my mind every time we bring up fascism. Well, yes, I think there is a difference. And do you want to speak to that? Yeah, you said... Do you want to answer to Ryan? No, not a response. <laughs> I just have a question. Okay, well, well let's, let's deal with that first. Um, why, why do you ask that? Um, because I think there's similarities between the two, um, and I think being taught in art school and in any school being taught a certain way, we come out this product to think in a similar manner, all of us, or, or you know, to think against something is still thinking in a similar way, like we're all, and so I'm just, I don't know, considering are you saying that, that this is a fascist seminar? But, uh, potentially. But like all, that's just the way seminars are structured. Or maybe not seminars, more so lectures. But um, so every if we're all, we all, all, we all read the same textbook, we're all being conditioned in a, in a certain way. <coughs> Fascism is not about everyone reading the same test textbook. Do you think that's what makes that's what makes something fascist? No, it's it's a way of thinking, I guess, and a way of an agreement of a community. Um, yes, but it's not an agreement of the community about anything. It's an agreement to not to let, for instance, um, transgender people into the army. It's an agreement not to let Mexicans uh, into the country. It's an agreement not to allow immigration. It's these kind of things. It's an agreement to, uh, to oppose everyone who is different. Now, if you think that's what we do in this seminar, then, then maybe you have the right, you, you have a reason to say that it is fascist. But just because we all read the same text, that's not what makes something fascist. We could all come together and decide to raise a barn together or build a wall together. I mean, that's a terrible example. <laughs> <laughs> I meant a nice wall, you know. Like <laughs> but I mean, it's just, I understand that there's like negative connotations or, or does it have to be negative to be fascist? Like, does it have to be discluding someone or something um, or is it just a way of thinking? Similarly, like having similar values. Can anyone help me here? Does it have to be negative to be fascist? I don't think so. I don't think it has to be negative. Yeah. 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 Because you, a lot of these things which they're talking about in the beginning, like going to the forest and I mean, all the ecological things, they seem very, very open. That's how they start. Then something takes over at some point. But that isn't really fascist, the question of excluding something. So if you say it's the same thing, you can't take black and white photographs, that would be fascist. Yeah. For 
because you're excluding something. That's what fashion does, it excludes Jews. But is that the actual definition? Is like, is excluding, like I want to know, I guess the definition, if it is. I'm not entirely sure why we are having this conversation. Um, it seems slight to slightly take us away from what we are uh, talking about. Um, I think, Ryan, if you... Uh, it's, 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 not, it's not a wrong question to ask. It's just not exactly relevant to what we are trying to do at the moment. Um, if you want to find out what fascism means um, and why it is used in a... Why, uh, why in this environment, and I, I think in most environments, it is considered a bad thing, and why this is kind of such a clear-cut uh, thing that, that fascism is bad, um, then we can look into it. Again, the, the book I recommended to, Lo to Laura earlier, The Mass, Mass Psychology of Fascism uh, by William Reich, um, could be a good starting point. At the same time, there are, of course, many people who, who don't think that fascism is a bad thing. There are many people who, who think that actually not letting in immigrants or, um, or transgender people or women is actually a good thing. So um, that, you know, um, at some point you just have to, you know, step back and uh, you're not going to, um, I guess, it's just something that you need to think about. Um, but I want to go back to uh, the question of truth. And um, <clears throat> what understanding of what is, what interpretation of truth lies at the foundation of this phenomenon? So Heidegger is saying, in the basis of truth, in the basis of this phenomena of the modern age, lies a specific understanding of <coughs> truth as correspondence between mental images and external reality. This, what you need to understand, it's a very specific way of thinking about truth that Heidegger says is unique to modernity. And the reason he says that is because for Heidegger, as Heidegger explains, uh, I'm not sure if it is actually in this text or in other texts in the same volume, he explains that truth was not always considered as a correspondence between the mental and the real. Uh, so, for instance, uh, the, 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 the Latin word for truth is, uh, is veritas. And uh, veritas is something verifiable, is something that can be tested and examined, um, and something rational. But before truth was understood as something rational, as something that can be verified and examined, in the Greek tradition, um, the word for truth was aletheia. Aletheia. And it meant something slightly different. Aletheia is made of two uh, words, a, which is an, like uh, any kind of negation. And lithia is from the word lethe, which is the river of the dead souls in uh, Greek mythology. Um, the river of the dead soul, lethe, runs through Hades, which is the underworld. And every soul that goes down to Hades, so when someone dies on earth and their soul goes down to Hades, they drink from this river Lethe, which is the river of forgetting, and they forget their life on earth. Yeah. yeah? So the, the Lethe is forgetting. What Alithia means? Alithia means unforgetting. So truth, oh hi. So truth means unforgetting, which is very different from correspondence, yeah? So, in the modern understanding of truth, 
how do you go after truth? But some of you were saying, well, it's science. So you send out a scientist with a, a laboratory kit to do an experiment. And by doing more experiments, we discover more truth. That's not the Greek understanding. The Greek understanding is all the truth is already here. The whole totality of truth is available to you. It's just that it is forgotten. The way to get to truth is not by experiment, is by unforgetting. To unforget something is like to turn a leaf, to move, to, let's say, to remove a veil, to reveal what is underneath. Truth is already here. You already know it. You knew all the truth all along. It's just that you forgot it. By revealing it, it comes back into, into, the, in, into the visible. So, so it's a completely different notion of truth, not, not as something you will have to discover, but something you need to uncover. So correspondence does, between mental images and, physical in, and the physical world doesn't come into the Greek notion of truth at all. What comes in is how do you uncover? So going back to the farmer, plowing the field outside their house. As you plow the field and you turn over the earth and you nourish the earth and it nourishes you back, you uncover something about your being. Your being is <coughs> that is part and parcel of this earth. You came from this earth, you will come back into this earth, you, you work it and it returns something to you. And in, in in this act of labor, which as Heidegger says is very different from culture, in this act of labor lies the truth of your being. So the truth of your being is not in splitting the atom or you know, uh, saying what the molecule of water is contained of, is in uncovering something in the plowing of the earth. Now you see, Laura, you asked one of the most important questions in the seminar today. Um, earlier on, what is so dangerous and fascist and seductive about Heidegger? It's precisely this sense of how by asking better questions, you really get to a deeper sense of meaning and to a deeper sense of truth, but how this very quest for authenticity, um, this very turning back on rationality can also become a very seductive romantic force that can draw people into, you know, into saying, yes, well, this earth is what I'm prepared to die for. I will shed my life for this earth, you know. One of the great um, Nazi slogans was, was earth and blood. How is it in German? Earth and blood. Something like that. Oh. No? Blood and Earth? Like the darn translation is You never heard it. Okay. Uh, I, I, but I will, I will find it for you because I think Heidi Adorno talks about it a lot. Uh, Oh, blood and soil. Blut und Boden. Blut und Boden. Yeah? Does, is, does that ring a bell as a slogan? Yeah? So you see, it's the same soil, but now you prepare to spill your blood for it and everyone else's blood, and that becomes a kind of... Um, a, a, a powerful um, propaganda tool. Okay, we're going to stop now. Um, so um, come next week if you are interested. And uh, we will continue with the same text. Sorry again.